Today, we're diving into the third section of Kimberly Crenshaw's seminal article, Race, Reform, and Retrenchment, Transformation and Legitimation in Anti-Discrimination Law. This section unpacks the transformative vision of critical legal scholars and scrutinizes its limitations, especially when it comes to addressing racial oppression. So, what do critical legal scholars propose? They argue that ideology is the main barrier to social change. By exposing this ideology, they believe we can reveal the shaky foundations of our legal and social systems, allowing us to reimagine and reshape our world. Sounds promising, right? Well, Crenshaw has some reservations. She points out that while these scholars are busy dissecting mainstream legal ideology, they often neglect racism as a foundational pillar that upholds American society. This glaring omission makes their analysis incomplete and their recommendations, especially for black Americans, somewhat unrealistic. But that's not all. Crenshaw also highlights that these scholars often operate in a theoretical bubble, disconnected from the lived experiences of racially oppressed communities. This detachment limits the applicability of their work, particularly when it comes to understanding the civil rights movement and the unique challenges that black Americans face. Now, let's talk about the tactic of trashing liberal legal ideology, a popular approach among critical scholars. While this might expose the limitations of our current legal discourse, Crenshaw questions its practical utility. She argues that the very process of legitimation, which these scholars aim to challenge, both creates and restricts opportunities for meaningful change. So what are the key takeaways? First, critical scholars often overlook the crucial role racism plays in American society. Second, there's a disconnect between their theoretical framework and the lived experiences of racially oppressed communities. Third, while they may be good at critiquing the system, they offer little in the way of practical guidance for navigating it. And lastly, the need to maintain social legitimacy can both open and close doors for transformative change. In conclusion, Crenshaw calls for a more nuanced approach. She argues that any effective strategy for social change must be deeply rooted in the lived experiences and specific needs of racially oppressed communities. Section 3, The New Left Attack, The Hegemonic Function of Legal Rights Discourse. Various scholars connected with the critical legal studies movement have offered critical analysis of law and legal reform, which provide a broad framework for explaining how legal reforms help mask and legitimate continuing racial inequality. The critics present law as a series of ideological constructs that operate to support existing social arrangements by convincing people that things are both inevitable and basically fair. Legal reform, therefore, cannot serve as a means for fundamentally restructuring society. This theory, however, is a general one, the utility of which is limited in the context of civil rights by its insufficient attention to racial domination. Removed from the reality of oppression, and its overwhelming constraints, the critics cannot fairly understand the choices the civil rights movement confronted or, still less, recommend solutions to its current problems. Subsection A, the critical vision. In broadest terms, critical scholars have attempted to analyze legal ideology and discourse as a social artifact which operates to recreate and legitimate American society. In order to discover the contingent character of the law, CLS scholars unpack legal doctrine to reveal both its internal inconsistencies generated by exposing the incoherence of legal arguments and its external inconsistencies, often by laying bare the inherently paradoxical and political worldviews embedded within legal doctrine. Having thus exposed the inadequacies of legal doctrine, CLS scholars go on to examine the political character of the choices that were made in the doctrine's name. 
This inquiry exposes the ways in which legal ideology has helped create, support, and legitimate America's present class structure. Number one, the role of legal ideology. Critical scholars derive their vision of legal ideology in part from the work of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian neo-Marxist theorist who developed an approach to understanding domination that transcends some of the limitations of traditional Marxist accounts. In examining domination as a combination of both physical coercion and ideological control, Gramsci developed the concept of hegemony, the means by which a system of attitudes and beliefs permeating both popular consciousness and the ideology of elites reinforces existing social arrangements and convinces the dominated classes that the existing order is inevitable. After observing the ability of the Italian system to withstand aggressive challenges in the years preceding the ascent of fascism, Gramsci concluded that when the state trembled a sturdy structure of civil society was at once revealed. The state was only an outer ditch behind which there stood a powerful system of fortresses and earthworks. Some critical scholars place great emphasis on understanding the fortifying earthworks of American society. The concept of hegemony allows critical scholars to explain the continued legacy of American society by revealing how legal consciousness induces people to accept or consent to their own oppression. Legal historian Robert Gordon, for example, declares that one should look not only at the undeniably numerous specific ways in which the legal system functions to screw poor people, but rather at all the ways in which the system seems at first glance basically uncontroversial, neutral, acceptable. This is Antonio Gramsci's notion of hegemony. That is, that the most effective kind of domination takes place when both the dominant and dominated classes believe that the existing order, with perhaps some marginal changes, is satisfactory, or at least represents the most that anyone could expect because things pretty much have to be the way that they are. According to Gordon, Gramsci directs our attention to the many thoughts and beliefs that people have adopted that limit their ability to even imagine that life could be different and better. Although society structures of thought have been constructed by elites out of a universe of possibilities, people reify these structures and clothe them with the illusion of necessity. Law is an essential feature in the illusion of necessity because it embodies and reinforces ideological assumptions about human relations that people accept as natural or even immutable. People act out their lives, mediate conflicts, and even perceive themselves with reference to the law. By accepting the bounds of law and ordering their lives according to its categories and relations, people think that they are confirming reality the way things must be. Yet, by accepting the view of the world implicit in the law, people are also bound by its conceptual limitations. Thus, conflict and antagonism are contained. The legitimacy of the entire order is never seriously questioned. Relating this idea to the limitations of anti-discrimination law, Alan Freeman argues that the legal reforms that grew out of the civil rights movement were severely limited by the ideological constraints embedded within the law and dictated by needs basic to the preservation of the class structure. These ideological pillars supporting the class structure were simultaneously repositories of racial domination and obstacles to the fundamental reordering of society. For example, Freeman argues that formal equality, combined with the fact that American law does not formally recognize any difference based on wealth, preclude most remedies which would have required the redistribution of wealth. Yet, economic exploitation and poverty have been central features of racial domination. Poverty is its long-term result. A legal strategy that does not include redistribution of wealth cannot remedy one of the most significant aspects of racial domination. Similarly, the myths of vested rights 
and equality of opportunity were necessary to protect the legitimacy of the dominant order and thus constituted insuperable barriers to the quest for significant redistributive reform. Freeman's central argument is that the severe limitations of legal reform were dictated by the legitimating role of legal discourse. If law functions to reinforce a worldview that things should be the way they are, then law cannot provide an effective means to challenge the present order. Some critics see the destructive role of rights rhetoric as another symptom of the law's legitimating function. Mark Tishnet has offered a four-tiered critique of rights. One, once one identifies what counts as a right in a specific setting, it invariably turns out that the right is unstable. Significant but relatively small changes in the social setting can make it difficult to sustain the claim that a right remains implicated. Two, the claim that a right is implicated in some settings produces no determinate consequences. Three, the concept of rights falsely converts to an empty abstraction, reifies real experiences that we ought to value for their own sake. Four, the use of rights in contemporary discourse impedes advances by progressive social forces. Tushnet's first and second arguments crystallize the doctrinal dilemmas faced by the civil rights community. Anti-discrimination doctrine does not itself provide determinate results. To give rights meaning, people must specify the world. They must create a picture of what is that grounds their normative interpretation. Tishnet's third and fourth arguments spell out pragmatic reasons to approach rights with caution. According to Tishnet, the language of rights undermines efforts to change things by absorbing real demands, experiences, and concerns into a vacuous and indeterminate discourse. The discourse abstracts real experiences and clouds the ability of those who invoke rights rhetoric to think concretely about real confrontations in real circumstances. According to Tushnet, the danger that arises from being swept into legal rights discourse is that people lose sight of their real objectives. Their visions and thoughts of the possible become trapped within the ideological limitations of the law. Tushnet suggests that if we treated experiences of solidarity and individuality as directly relevant to our political discussions, instead of passing them through the filter of the language of rights, we would be in a better position to address the political issues on the appropriate level. Peter Gable suggests that the belief in rights and in the state serves a hegemonic function through will delusion. Belief in the state is a flight from the immediate alienation of concrete existence into a split-off sphere of people's minds in which they imagine themselves to be a part of an imaginary political community, citizens of the United States of America. And it's this collective projection and internalization of an imaginary political authority that is the basis of the legitimation of hierarchy. It's the mass psychological foundation of democratic consent. Hegemony is reinforced through this state abstraction because people believe in and react passively to a mere illusion of political consensus. Gordon, Freeman, Tushnet, and Gable all assert that these abstractions blind people to the contingent nature of human existence when people act as if these illusions are real. They actually recreate their own oppressive world moment by moment. Two, transformation in the critical vision. The vision of change that critical scholars express flows directly from their focus on ideology as the major obstacle that separates the actual from the possible. Because it is ideology that prevents people from conceiving of, and hence from implementing, a freer social condition. The critics propose the exposure of ideology as the first logical step towards social transformation, emphasizing how ideology obscures the contingency of human relations. Gordon proposes unearthing conventional thought in order to excavate the potential for change. 
The point is to unfreeze the world as it appears to common sense as a bunch of more or less objectively determined social relations and to make it appear as it really is. People acting, imagining, rationalizing, justifying. Gable, too, argues that it is necessary to reveal the ways in which law is actually constitutive of our social existence. He believes that this can best be achieved by experiencing the character of living through legal ideas, while at the same time critiquing the ways in which these phenomena appear in our unreflective consciousness. Reflecting his concern that Wright's discourse misdirects and abstracts our struggle for a better society, Tushnet also advocates ongoing critique, proposing that popular aspirations for change be recast in the language of solidarity and individuality rather than in the language of rights. Although Alan Freeman does not offer a transformative strategy in his work on anti-discrimination law, he has advocated delegitimation or trashing elsewhere. Explaining the critical commitment to trashing, Freeman states that the point of delegitimation is to expose possibilities more truly expressing reality, possibilities of fashioning a future that might at least partially realize a substantive notion of justice instead of the abstract, rightsy, traditional, bourgeois notions of justice that generate so much of the contradictory scholarship. One must start by knowing what is going on, by freeing oneself from the mystified delusions embedded in our consciousness by the liberal legal worldview. I'm not defending a form of scholarship that simply offers another affirmative presentation. Rather, I am advocating negative, critical activity as the only path that might lead to a liberated future. Although the focus of their critiques may differ, the critics all premise their views of transformative possibility on the necessity of critically engaging dominant ideology. Viewing the structures of legal thought as central to the perception of the world as necessary and the status quo as legitimate, they believe it is crucial to demonstrate the contingency of legal ideology. Once false necessity or contingency is revealed, the critics suggest, people will be able to remake their world in a different way. Subsection B a critique of the critique, the problem of context. The critics offer an analysis that is useful in understanding the limited transformative potential of anti-discrimination rhetoric. There are difficulties, however, in attempting to use critical themes and ideas to understand the civil rights movement and to describe what alternatives the civil rights constituency could have pursued or might now pursue. While critical scholars claim their project is concerned with domination, few have made more than a token effort to address racial domination specifically, and their work does not seem grounded in the reality of the racially oppressed. This deficiency is especially apparent in critiques that relate to racial issues. Critical scholars have criticized mainstream legal ideology for its tendency to portray American society as basically fair and thereby to legitimate the oppressive policies that have been directed towards racial minorities. Yet, critical scholars do not sufficiently account for the effects or the causes of the oppression that they routinely acknowledge. The result is that critical literature exhibits the same proclivities of mainstream scholarship. It seldom speaks to or about black people. The failure of the critics to incorporate racism into their analysis also renders their critique of rights and their overall analysis of law in America incomplete. Specifically, this failure leads to an inability to appreciate fully the transformative significance of the civil rights movement in mobilizing black Americans and generating new demands. Further, the failure to consider the reality of those most oppressed by American institutions means that the critical account of the hegemonic nature of legal thought overlooks a crucial dimension of American life, the ideological role of racism itself. Gordon, Freeman, Tushnet, and Gable fail to analyze racism as an ideological pillar upholding American society 
or as the principal basis for black oppression. The critics' failure to analyze the hegemonic role of racism also renders their prescriptive analysis unrealistic. In the spirit of Alan Freeman's declaration, critics often appear to view the trashing of legal ideology as the only path that might lead to a liberated future. Yet, if trashing is the only path that might lead to a liberated future, black people are unlikely to make it to the critics' promised land. The critics' commitment to trashing is premised on a notion that people are mystified by liberal legal ideology and consequently cannot remake their world until they see how contingent such ideology is. The critics' principal error is that their version of domination by consent does not present a realistic picture of racial domination. Coercion explains much more about racial domination than does ideologically induced consent. Black people do not create their oppressive worlds moment to moment, but rather are coerced into living in worlds created and maintained by others. Moreover, the ideological source of this coercion is not liberal legal consciousness, but racism. If racism is just as important as, if not more important than, liberal legal ideology in explaining the persistence of white supremacy, then the critics' single-minded effort to deconstruct liberal legal ideology will be futile. Finally, in addition to exaggerating the role of liberal legal consciousness and underestimating that of coercion, critics also disregard the transformative potential that liberalism offers. Although liberal legal ideology may indeed function to mystify, it remains receptive to some aspirations that are central to Blacks' demands and may also perform an important function in combating the experience of being excluded and oppressed. This receptivity to Black aspirations is crucial given the hostile social world that racism creates. The most troubling aspect of the critical program, therefore, is that trashing rights consciousness may have the unintended consequence of disempowering the racially oppressed while leaving white supremacy basically untouched. These difficulties are discussed below as they relate to the critiques of Gordon, Freeman, and Tushnet. Subsection 1. Gordon, the underemphasis on coercion. Robert Gordon's explanation of the ideological domination illustrates how an exclusive focus on consent leaves gaping holes in his readers' understanding of hegemony. Gordon writes that beliefs are the main constraints upon making social life more bearable. Yet, how can others understand the fact that black people, although unable to bring about a world in which they fully participate, can imagine such a world? Clearly, something other than their own structure of thought prevents blacks from changing their world. This fact suggests that a more complete explanation of domination requires that coercion and consent be considered together. The coercive power of the state operates to suppress some groups, particularly when there is consensus among others that such coercion is warranted. Racism serves to single out blacks as one of these groups worthy of suppression. Gordon, however, does not offer any way to understand this. If its exclusive focus on ideological domination is to be taken literally, one is left believing that black Americans are unable to change the world because they accept the dominant ideology and thus cannot imagine an alternative existence. Yet to say that the beliefs of black Americans have boxed them into a subordinate existence because of what they believe is to ignore the history of course of racial subordination. Indeed, it would be difficult for blacks, given the contradiction between American fiction and black American reality, to believe as much of the American mythology as whites do. The most significant aspect of black oppression seems to be what is believed about black Americans, not what black Americans believe. Black people are boxed in largely because there is a consensus among many whites that the oppression of blacks is legitimate. This is where consensus and coercion should be understood together. Ideology convinces one group that the coercive domination of another is legitimate. It matters little whether the coerced group rejects the dominant ideology and can offer a competing conception of the world if they have been labeled other 
by the dominant ideology, they are not heard. Blacks seem to carry the stigma of otherness, which effectively precludes their potentially radicalizing influence from penetrating the dominant consciousness. If this is the case, then blacks will gain little through simply transcending their own belief structures. The challenge for blacks may be to pursue strategies that confront the beliefs about them by whites. For blacks, such strategies may take the form of reinforcing some aspects of the dominant ideology in attempts to become participants in the dominant discourse rather than outsiders defined, objectified, and reified by that discourse. In this sense, the civil rights movement might be considered as an attempt to deconstruct the image of the Negro in the white mind. By forcing the political system to respond to black demands, blacks rejected images of complacency and docility that had been invoked by some whites to dismiss black demands. Although Gordon sets out to analyze hegemonic domination, he ends up revealing little about the oppression of those most dominated. This oversight probably results from his efforts to absorb the coercive elements of class rule into the consensual elements of ideological hegemony. This, however, is not consistent with Gramsci's view of hegemony. Gramsci explicitly recognized that the two fundamental types of political control, coercion and hegemonic consensus, were dialectically linked and thus had to be understood together. In Gramsci's view, hegemony consists of, one, the spontaneous consent given by the great masses of the population, and two, the apparatus of state coercive power, which legally enforces discipline on those groups who do not consent either actively or passively. An alternative approach more consistent with the dual nature of control would be to discuss or perhaps suggest how the coercion of non-consenting groups may provide an important reinforcement to the creation of consensus among classes that do accept the legitimacy of the dominant order. I have alluded to the possibility that the coercion of blacks may provide a basis for others to consent to the dominant order. An analysis of hegemony that includes racial subordination suggests that the creation of a clearly visible other whose interests are seen as being opposed in every way to the interest of those who identify by virtue of color and culture with the dominant class is a hegemonic tool used to maintain legitimacy. In part four, I will discuss this otherness as one way of understanding how racism plays a hegemonic role and how legal reform has both transformed and legitimated this dynamic. Subsection 2, Freeman. Failure to analyze racism as hegemonic. Alan Freeman's discussion of anti-discrimination law suffers from a failure to ground the critique in the historical and ideological conditions that brought about anti-discrimination law. This is puzzling, both because Freeman has written more than any other critical scholar on anti-discrimination law and because he clearly recognizes the uniqueness of racism as a system of domination. Freeman's work pays too little attention to racism's role in legitimating American society and isolating blacks. He also overlooks one of the consequences of this history of racism. Blacks have succeeded in diminishing this isolation by relying on and deploying the very ideological presuppositions that Freeman attempts to delegitimize. As I've discussed above, Freeman argues that the needs basic to the preservation of the class structure compelled rejection of a developing perspective that would have required an America in which blacks were substantively better off, not simply the recipients of formally equal treatment. Oddly, in his account, None of the needs that force this retrenchment is connected to racism, that is, white supremacy and racial stratification. In Freeman's account of the social, political, and ideological necessities that underlay the Supreme Court's Brown decision, the need to respond to racism and race issues, not the need to deal with class issues, gave birth to anti-discrimination law. Freeman's discussion of the forces that led to retrenchment, however, is couched only in terms of preserving class structure. This failure to discuss the retrenchment in racial terms undermines the force of his analysis, especially in light of the racial character of the subsequent political retrenchment. Freeman argues that affirmative action and other remedial programs 
conflicted with beliefs about formal equality, vested rights, and equal opportunity. Thus, the preservation of these myths compelled the rejection of these remedies, lest whites and people of color discover that these myths were contingent ideas and thus undermine their beliefs in the legitimacy of American class structure. Indeed, he notes that the more the civil rights law threatened the system of equality of opportunity, which threat was essential to the production of victim perspective results, the more it threatened to expose and delegitimize the relative situation of lower class whites. Freeman implies that the concern that forced the curtailment of affirmative action was the fear that whites would question the legitimacy of the class structure once it was revealed that equal opportunity and vestedness were contingent. Yet a different interpretation suggests that whites were unlikely to question the legitimacy of these conceptions, but rather would question the legitimacy of racial remedies that relied upon a suspension of these myths. Indeed, the fact that these promises had been suspended seemed to make whites believe in and cling to them all the more. Freeman fails to analyze the ways in which whites were on the defensive, not because the promise of vestedness had proven unstable, but because blacks had been granted some privileges at their expense. The most prevalent threat was not that the ideology would be exposed as fraudulent and that whites would attack the ideology, but that there would be a white backlash against blacks and against institutions perceived as sympathetic to black interests. This problem could be rectified, as it has been, by narrowing the focus of anti-discrimination law, thereby sacrificing the interest of blacks in order to appease the majority. There was something significant about affirmative action and other civil rights policies that gave rise to a crisis in a way that other more devastating or more common ideological disruptions have not. This suggests that the relatively subordinate status of blacks serves a stabilizing function in this society. At least one consequence of this stabilizing function is that special attention is directed towards the status of blacks so that ideological deviations arising out of racial issues do not evade popular detection. The tremendous controversy surrounding the Baki case provides an excellent illustration. Freeman would describe the controversy as arising largely from White's reaction to suspension of the equal opportunity myth in relation to school admissions. There were other deviations from equal opportunity, however, in the UC Davis Medical School admissions program that Baki and other affirmative action opponents could have attacked. Yet advantages granted to others, such as the wealthy, did not appear as presumptively illegitimate as did those granted to minority candidates. The outcry over the specter of unqualified minorities being granted privileges over qualified whites was not simply a reaction to the suspension of competition per se, nor was it merely a reaction, as white affirmative action opponents in particular would argue, to a fundamental hostility to racial preferences. Racial preferences for whites have existed for years with the tacit and often explicit support of these very opponents. Thus, we must assume that either the adamant disbelievers in racial equality suddenly converted and became racial equality's high priest, or more likely that what really outraged whites about affirmative action was merely that minorities were now getting something at their expense. This race-specific explanation of affirmative action retrenchment is exactly what Freeman's legitimation explanation fails to analyze adequately. Although we can only speculate why Freeman does not discuss the forced withdrawal of expansive race reform policies in more racial terms, such an omission is consistent with the assumption that racism is not a central ideological construct of the system. Rejecting what he considers to be the Marxist instrumental view of racism, Freeman declares, given the presence of other powerful ideologies that serve to arrest the development of class consciousness, racism seems only marginally necessary and perhaps superfluous if regarded from a functional point of view. This view is further evidenced in Freeman's critique of those who argued that progress in civil rights has advanced class struggle. The assault on racism under such circumstances will come to a halt, lest it unleash too much white rage or expose the reality of class relationships. There is nothing particularly radical about the goal of ending racial discrimination. 
The goal would be achieved if nine whites were stratified across American society in percentages similar to whites. The class structure would remain intact. What is particularly disconcerting about this analysis is that it appears simply to collapse issues of race into issues of class in only a slightly more sophisticated fashion than do the traditional Marxist accounts of racism that Freeman criticizes so cogently. Freeman's failure to see the attack on white supremacy as radical typifies his failure to critique the ways in which racism operates together with, but differently from, class ideology central to the maintenance of hegemony. Without such analysis of racism's role in maintaining hegemony, his explanation simply does not convincingly capture the political realities of racism and the inevitability of white backlash against any serious attempts to dismantle the machinery of white supremacy. Number three, Tushnet, the problem of pragmatism without context. The problem with Tushnet's critique of rights is perhaps most evident when he rhetorically queries. Can anyone really think that it helps either in changing society or in understanding how society changes to discuss whether protesters were exercising rights protected by the First Amendment? The answer to Tushnet's rhetorical question, given the thrust of his critique, is, of course, no. What really matters, says Tushnet, is not whether people are exercising rights, but whether their action is politically effective. If, however, the inquiry is squarely placed within a historical context, the implied disparity between thinking about change in terms of rights and thinking about politically effective action might be diminished. Perhaps the action of the civil rights community was effective, for example, because it raised the novel idea of blacks exercising rights. Indeed, thinking in terms of rights may have been a radical and liberating activity for blacks. Tushnet suggests that thinking in terms of rights is incompatible with feelings of solidarity and is not helpful in determining how to be politically effective. The expression of rights, however, was a central organizing feature of the civil rights movement because rights that other Americans took for granted were routinely denied to black Americans. Blacks' assertion of their rights constituted a serious ideological challenge to white supremacy. Their demand was not just for a place in the front of a bus, but for inclusion in the American political imagination. In asserting rights, blacks defied a system which had long determined that blacks were not and should not have been included. Whether or not the extension of these rights has ultimately legitimated the subordinate status of blacks, the use of rights rhetoric was a radical movement-building act. Because Tushnet's critique of rights is not sufficiently related to racism, his prescriptive comments are unpersuasive. Tushnet argues that the only circumstance in which rights should be used is when, on pragmatic consideration, they appear useful. He then argues that rights may not be pragmatically useful, but instead may actually impede the progress of the party of humanity. There do seem to be substantial pragmatic reasons to think that abandoning the rhetoric of rights would be the better course to pursue for now. People need food and shelter right now, and demanding that those needs be satisfied, whether or not satisfying them can today persuasively be characterized as enforcing a right, strikes me as more likely to succeed than claiming that existing rights to food and shelter must be enforced. One wonders, however, whether a demand for shelter that does not employ rights rhetoric is likely to succeed in America today. The underlying problem, especially for African Americans, is the question of how to extract from others that which others are not predisposed to give. As Tushnet has said himself, rights are a way of saying that a society is what it is, or that it ought to live up to its deepest commitments. This is essentially what all groups of dispossessed people say when they use rights rhetoric. As demonstrated in the civil rights movement, engaging in rights rhetoric can be an attempt to turn society's institutional logic against itself, to redeem some of the rhetorical promises and the self-congratulations that seem to thrive in American political discourse. Subsection C. Questioning the transformative view, some doubts about thrashing. The critic's product is of limited utility to blacks in its present form. 
The implications for blacks of thrashing liberal legal ideology are troubling, even though it may be proper to assail belief structures that obscure liberating possibilities. Trashing legal ideology seems to tell us repeatedly what has already been established, that legal discourse is unstable and relatively indeterminate. Furthermore, trashing offers no idea of how to avoid the negative consequences of engaging in reformist discourse or how to work around such consequences. Even if we imagine the wrong world when we think in terms of legal discourse, we must nevertheless exist in a present world where legal protection has at times been a blessing, albeit a mixed one. The fundamental problem is that, although critics criticize law because it functions to legitimate existing institutional arrangements, it is precisely this legitimating function that has made law receptive to certain demands in this area. The critical emphasis on deconstruction as the vehicle for liberation leads to the conclusion that engaging in legal discourse should be avoided because it reinforces not only the discourse itself, but also the society and the world that it embodies. Yet critics offer little beyond this observation. Their focus on delegitimating rights rhetoric seems to suggest that once rights rhetoric has been discarded, there exists a more productive strategy for change, one which does not reinforce existing patterns of domination. Unfortunately, no such strategy has yet been articulated, and it is difficult to imagine that racial minorities will ever be able to discover one. As Francis Fox Piven and Richard Cloward point out in their excellent account of the civil rights movement, popular struggles are a reflection of institutionally determined logic and a challenge to that logic. People can only demand change in ways that reflect the logic of the institutions they are challenging. Demands for change that do not reflect the institutional logic, that is, demands that do not engage and subsequently reinforce the dominant ideology will probably be ineffective. The possibility for ideological change is created through the very process of legitimation, which is triggered by crisis. Powerless people can sometimes trigger such a crisis by challenging an institution internally, that is, by using its own logic against it. Such crisis occurs when powerless people force open and politicize a contradiction between the dominant ideology and their reality. The political consequences of maintaining the contradictions may sometimes force an adjustment, an attempt to close the gap or to make things appear fair. Yet, because the adjustment is triggered by the political consequences of the contradiction, circumstances will be adjusted only to the extent necessary to close the apparent contradiction. This approach to understanding legitimation and change is applicable to the civil rights movement. Because blacks were challenging their exclusion from political society, the only claims that were likely to achieve recognition were those that reflected American society's institutional logic, legal rights ideology. Articulating their formal demands through legal rights ideology, civil rights protesters exposed a series of contradictions. The most important being the promised privileges of American citizenship and the practice of absolute racial subordination. Rather than using the contradictions to suggest that American citizenship was itself illegitimate or false, civil rights protesters proceeded as if American citizenship were real and demanded to exercise the rights that citizenship entailed. By seeking to restructure reality to reflect American mythology, blacks relied upon and ultimately benefited from politically inspired efforts to resolve the contradictions by granting formal rights. Although it is the need to maintain legitimacy that presents powerless groups with the opportunity to wrest concessions from the dominant order, it is the very accomplishment of legitimacy that forecloses greater possibilities. In sum, the potential for change is both created and limited by legitimation. The central issue that the critics fail to address then is how to avoid the legitimating effects of reform if engaging in reformist discourse is the only effective way to challenge the legitimacy of the social order. Perhaps the only situation in which powerless people may receive any favorable response is where there is a political or ideological need to restore an image of fairness that has somehow been tarnished. Most efforts to change an oppressive situation 
are bound to adopt the dominant discourse to some degree. On the other hand, Peter Gable may well be right in observing that the reforms which come from such demands are likely to transform a given situation only to the extent necessary to legitimate those elements of the situation that must remain unchanged. Thus, it might just be the case that oppression means being between a rock and a hard place, that there are risks and dangers involved both in engaging in the dominant discourse and in failing to do so. What subordinated people need is an analysis which can inform them how the risks can be minimized and how the rocks and the very hard places can be negotiated.